Hi everyone, this is Carolyn Griffin. I am Riot's Events and Operations Manager. Thank you for joining us today for Riot 46, um, profitable, profitable Problem Solvers, How Startups Are Changing the World. Before we get started, I just have a couple of quick reminders for everyone. Um, all of the people who are attending are on mute. If you do have any questions, please, I encourage you to put those in the Q&A box or the chat box. We will make sure all of your questions get answered at the end of the presentation. And this presentation is being recorded. It will be posted on Riot's YouTube channel as well as on Riot's meetup page. So you need to hop off early, no problem. You will be able to view the entire presentation later. But without further ado, I would like to introduce Riot's program director, Rachel Newberry, who will be leading our discussion today. Thank you, Caroline. Hi, everybody. This is Rachel Newberry. Um, I am at Riot Labs, so I'm excited to be here. And um, actually, one of our panelists today is in the same building, so <laughs> it's great to, to be near everybody. Um, welcome to Riot's live webinar series. Um, today, we are going to hear from some profitable problem solvers. So many in the Riot network are driving innovation for good, focusing on causes that really change the world for the better. Um, but ultimately, businesses do have to be sustainable in order to have long-term impact. So we'll hear about the, the sort of balance between finding viable business models around mission-driven solutions. Um, but before we jump into our panel, I uh, am thrilled today to have the opportunity to have a quick conversation with Daniel Crook at IBM. Uh, Daniel is the CTO of IBM's Call for Code. Call for Code is an incredibly mission-driven initiative for IBM. So Daniel, welcome. Thank you for being here today. Great. Thank you for having me, Rachel. Awesome. So um, give us some background on Call for Code and why IBM has launched this initiative. I know you guys have been doing this for a couple of years. Yeah, so we launched the Call for Code initiative uh, in 2018 in partnership with the Linux Foundation, the United Nations, and several other public and private partners. And uh, it's a five-year program, but it has an annual competition. So we've had winners in 2018 and 2019. And the goal is to get developers, technologists to look at some of the world's most pressing humanitarian issues, create solutions for them that can live on as sustainable open source projects. So it's not just a tech for good initiative where you get a prize and go home. The goal is really support those ideas, ensure they're delivered where they're needed most. So, yeah, and the, the top teams each year, they win um, a cash prize uh, for participating, but they also have support from the Linux Foundation to build an open source community. And we as IBM help each of the winning teams by supplying them with volunteers to help them with hardware development, software development, community building, user experience, uh, and business development. Great. It's a truly collaborative program, really awesome partnerships that you all have built. Um, I know it, in the past, you guys have worked with a really cool IoT mesh network project, but tell us about that and some of the other projects that have come through Call for Code. Yeah, so we each year we identify five top finalists and uh, the top two, the team, the top team from each year, we uh, we really work closely with them to bring their 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 technology to life. So first year's winner was Project Owl. Uh, they created a mesh network um, inspired by what happened in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria where power was restored fairly quickly. Uh, you can always find alternatives, generators, solar, things like that, but communications, network connectivity is really something that's a little harder to reestablish. So they created a system and the goal is just to establish 1% connectivity, just enough as quick as possible with a disposable cheap net mesh network system that's either in place in advance or can be deployed quickly. And it's just enough for folks to join um, a pop-up um, captive portal, like you'd see at a coffee shop or a hotel, get in there, it uses that interface instead of a new app to just get some messages that folks can enter over the network. So a really cool solution. We work with them in Puerto Rico on four different deployments, connecting with them with public and private partners. Uh, they've got a thriving open source community through the Linux Foundation now, um, and open source the core of their technology while building a business model around it um, through the Linux Foundation as the cluster duck protocol. So great, great. ducks are what they call those little things. Um, and then there's another great team that won last year, Prometeo. So they're a team of folks from, from Spain, comprised of actually a firefighter on the team, um, a nurse on the team, a PhD project manager and engineer, uh, a data scientist and a full stack developer. And so they came together, created a solution, a simple IoT device that attaches to a, a wildfire firefighter's uniform. And that collects information about the toxins the firefighter is exposed to. 
So you can see in real time um, who's maybe been exposed to too much carbon monoxide, benzene, formaldehyde, things like that that come out of burning wildfires and also capture that information over the long term so they can make better decisions about their health. So really cool projects coming out of there and happy to support them. Awesome. That is, that's fantastic. Um, so I know you all focus on specific themes. Uh, tell us about the 2020 themes and, and the projects you're working with around COVID-19. Sure. So the last couple of years, we focused on natural disasters. Uh, we broadened that out when we launched in February to include climate change, um, since uh, natural disasters are kind of a byproduct in many ways of climate change. So going to the core of the problem. So within that, we had a climate change track focused on energy sustainability, water sustainability, and disaster resiliency. But as the pandemic started to affect um, people around the world, we added a second track. So this is around social and business uh, applications to address the impact of the pandemic, not developing vaccines, not doing deep research, but helping people, small businesses get back on their feet, for example. So the competition is still open till the end of July. We recognize some early submissions are already working with those teams to deploy. Um, but the competition goes until July 31st, and uh, we'll be working with the teams, identifying, judging, and um, recognizing them in October for deployment shortly afterwards. Great. Yeah, Riot did our own kind of COVID-19 challenge that we called Mission R. So it's been really fun to see the innovation coming out of the really challenging time that, that we're in. So I'm um, glad to see IBM supporting those projects as well. Um, so what do you all look for when you're evaluating submissions? What's most important to IBM? Yeah, so we use four judging criteria. Uh, there's how complete the project is. Um, you know, there's no real right answer for how complete it is, but um, completeness, uh, whether it's solving like the real problem that's been identified and elucidated as to this is what we're doing with technology. We're not just throwing blockchain, for example, at some abstract problem. Here's how we're solving that problem. We look at um, uh, whether it can be transferred around the world. So if it's built for hurricanes in North Carolina, is it something that maybe goes for cyclones in Mozambique, typhoons in the Philippines? So we look to see how much, if at all, it's transferable or can be you know, expanded out to do that. And finally, just how creative it is. Does it bring a totally new viewpoint to the situation? Is it 10 times better on some aspect? Um, and, and just really creative. And there's, the, there's a spark of idea in there that can be fleshed out. So all those four criteria work together. And uh, that's the way we look at them, but we do want sustainable open source projects that can be supported not only by, by IBM, IBM, but the open source community, public and private partners, small and large academic institutions, um, and help deliver value. Great, great. Yeah, I think sustainability is going to be a big theme of today, even as we're looking at things that are, are truly mission driven, you know, we, we want them to be sustainable. Um, Daniel, finally, uh, if folks from the Riot ecosystem want to get involved, how might they plug into Call for Code? Uh, so if you go to callforcode.org, you'll find out about the competition, the rules, the schedules, some of the judges that we've uh, we've had to select the ideas, including actually Mark Cuban was part of our panel earlier this year for some of the, the COVID solutions, uh, President Bill Clinton, a bunch of other experts from the community as well. So you'll learn about uh, the competition, who's involved, how we select them. And uh, if your organization wants to take part, um, maybe uh, sign up as a supporter or contribute some technology to participants to use, join our live streams. You can do that all through callforcode.org. And if you want to participate, um, again, you don't just have to have a software engineering degree or be an IoT hardware expert. Um, just like last year's winner, they had a cross-functional team with the firefighter, their customer, embedded on their, their Agile team. So um, check it out and hopefully we contribute and see your solution by the end of July. Awesome. Great. Well, before we let you go, Daniel, um, I'll, I'll ask one more question. Um, as you've been involved with this initiative over the past few years, what's most inspiring to you? Uh, well, it's, we originally thought that, you know, it would be technologists kind of raising to the challenges that we offered in front of them from, from experts in the, in the community, but to see people who are new to technology, but have this great other experience, domain expertise, like said, firefighters, folks that are on the ground, they see the problems in their communities, and they now realize technology is a point where we can try to apply it and, and learn about this. It's, it's about building skills to help their community, but also improve their career prospects and, and you know, it maybe improve the success of their startup by learning how to be part of something like this and then build a sustainable company around it. So and awesome. Yeah. So diverse stakeholders are, are certainly important. And I think, um, yeah, we see a lot of, of different folks that don't consider themselves technologists or entrepreneurs um, coming together to, to build these mission driven projects. So that's great. Well, thank you for being here, Daniel. We certainly appreciate your time.
Um, for anybody on the call that has questions for Daniel, please add those to the chat and, uh, and we'll address those later. Um, but yeah, let's, let's move along. Thanks again, Daniel. Great. Thank you for having me. All right. I would like to introduce our panelists for today. These are our profitable problem solvers joining us. We have Brandon Kashani, Matt Bauer, Crystal Dreisbach, and Krissa johnson Sotomayor on the call today. Um, quickly, I will let the panelists introduce themselves. So, Crystal, let's start with you. I think you're on mute, Crystal. Hi, everyone. Crystal Dreisbach, the Executive Director of Don't Waste Durham, which is a nonprofit that in incubated my company and the company creates solutions that prevent trash. Um, the company was built on the fact that trash is preventable and that the trash we create is really no longer supporting the planetary parameters for human life. So I helped uh, found Green to Go, which is our now three year reusable takeout container service. Um, and we have a mobile software. We're now adding coffee cups and tech enabled pizza boxes. And we're also working on an IoT robotics uh, project to fix the struggling recycling industry. So I really, I looked around and I didn't think that anyone working in this space was working hard enough on this issue. So I concluded that it had to be me. <laughs> Love it. Thank you, Crystal. Uh, Matt, I'll pass it over to you. All right. Thanks, Rachel. Well, I've, uh, I've walked a, a dual path for much of the last few decades, one helping to start and run a number of telecom related uh, for profit and for good, all of them have been both sides, Federal Telecom, Connect Space, and Sparrow. And now I'm splitting my time between WRC, uh, helping launch and build out the new Connected Communities Initiative, which you'll hear more about, I'm sure, in these coming weeks and months, and uh, also working with a uh, VC in New York called Asprin Capital Partners. I've also helped start uh, and run a few nonprofits, one low country, local first, which is in Charleston, just south of uh, y'all, I guess I can say that. I lived there for a while, so I can use that term and uh, been involved in many, many others um, at a board level, local, regional, national, and, uh, and uh, in addition, I'm a, I'm a radio show host and DJ now. That's my, one of my life, life dreams, so I've been doing that the last year in Winter, in Winter Park, uh, Colorado. All right, very nice. Okay, Krissa, would you like to say hello? I'd like to hear more about that one. <laughs> Everybody remembers, um, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, my dream is like growing a garden finally. So, you know, nothing spectacular. But we're eating from it, so it's pretty cool. Anyway, um, I'm Krista Johnson Sotomayor, Chief Operating Officer of Soto IP. We're an um, intellectual property consulting firm specifically um, supporting the startup and, and scaling growth communities uh, nationally, but certainly very strongly in our own backyard in the region. Um, as well, a former uh, lead organizer and now ambassador at large for the One Million Caps program. It's a Kauffman Foundation program specifically to support startups, uh, of which Crystal is a former presenter, so we're really pleased to, about that. Um, it is a platform that allows startups to tell their story. It's not a pitch purposely, right? We're all volunteers doing this to help build community, um, and it, it's all about letting, um, have, having a space, creating a space where startup founders can safely tell their story and get immediate feedback from the community, um, usually comprised of fellow entrepreneurs, mentors, IBMers, Ciscoers, you know, individuals in the community who might be thinking about dipping their toe into the entrepreneurial space and want to learn more about it and or have just a wealth of experience, you know, such as Daniel, who would, could come and sit and guide and give input. Um, so it weaves a really, I think, important fabric to help support our entrepreneurs. Thank you, Krista. And finally, Brandon. Yes, thank you, Rachel. Hi, everyone. My name is Brandon Kashani. I'm the founder and CEO of TrackIt. We make wearable tracking devices for children and we market them to amusement parks. It's a daily rental model 
So parent walks in the park, they rent the band, they pair it with our app, and then they can track their child throughout the day. If anything happens, they lose sight of their child, hopefully they just open up the app and find a location and walk up to them. But in the event that the kid's on the other side of the park or somewhere not easily accessible, they can say, I've lost my child. The location will go to park security. They go get the child and reunite them with the parent. Great, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for being here, y'all. We're, we're excited to have you. So we have two startup founders on this call, both Crystal and Brandon are Riot Accelerator Program alumni. Um, entrepreneurs, of course, have to start with a problem, and both of you have clear cases of being very personally compelled by a problem. So tell us what inspired you to create your companies. Uh, Crystal, I'll start with you. Yeah, I was working in public health research uh, before I became an entrepreneur, and I was really uh, rather confused and concerned about styrofoam takeout containers, because at least from a, a public health perspective, um, they're very unhealthy for humans, um, not let alone the environment. And there seemed to be no uh, oper there seemed to be no alternatives uh, for restaurants and food vendors. And I invented the reusable takeout container service uh, as the first thing, uh, which everyone told me wouldn't work. Um, but I just couldn't give up on it. It would keep me awake at night. Um, that no one was meaningfully working on this. And I left my public health career and um, started the company. I started basically from a handful of passionate people um, and now um, has, you know, um, we're now part of a 15 member reuse program call that is from reuse programs all over the world, um, like us, including Australia, China, Germany, new ones all the time and we're contributing as global thought leaders. Love it, thank you, Crystal. Brandon, what about you? What inspired you to start Tracked? Yeah, so I was studying chemical engineering at State, and in my last semester, I decided to take an entrepreneurship class that had nothing to do with my major. And in there, we had a class project, which was to make a tracking device for children in public venues. And part of the class research, I reached out to a bunch of different public venues and in a small amusement park or small to midsize and Virginia responded. I was like, yeah, come on up here and meet us. And I had done very minimal research on the project just because it was class homework. So I Google how many kids go missing in amusement parks and the first article said 10 to 11 kids across the whole country. So I go up there and I'm expecting to meet one on one with the head of operations who had responded and I walk in the room. And the room is filled with head of marketing, head of admissions, head of security. Everyone in that company was there or in that in that park. And I was like, you guys know I'm not a real startup. It's just an idea. And they all laugh and said, yeah, we're here to help. So I told them I've done some research and I see 10 to 11 kids go missing between all the parks in the country every day. So you guys probably get one every once in a while. And they all started laughing. They said on an average day, just at their park, they lose 40 to 50 kids. On like 4th of July, they lost 110 kids. So right then, I was like, all right, I found a problem and I'm going to provide a solution to this so that no parent has to go through the separation from their child in a public venue. And that's how track it started. Great, thanks, Brandon. Yeah, I love hearing that story. Um, and, and your case is really interesting too because you you kind of stumbled upon this problem that was much more massive than you originally thought. and. And there's clear market need as kind of indicated by that huge first meeting that you had. So um, it's uh, been no great. solution out there right now meant for a theme park setting. Yeah, absolutely. Great. So we'll hear more about that in, in a bit. Um, Matt, I want to jump over to you. Uh, you have a long history of founding and, and being a part of companies that aim to positively impact the world. Um, one company that you co-founded is Better World Technology. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that mission? Sure. I. Um... It's, it's hard to think back that far, but in 2002, it was a, it was a crazy time to start a, a telecom company or the internet bubble had just popped and even bigger than that was the telecom bus, which, uh, which, so starting a, a green telecom company, people thought we had, you know, three heads sticking out and uh, it was uh, something we were very passionate about. Because, you know, we've been, my co-founder, Jim Kenefick, and I, who are still working together after all these years, um, you know, we're both very passionate about 
different causes, and we both have been in telecom uh, starting and running companies for some time. And so we said, well, how, how, what happens if we merge these together? And what that looked like in the beginning was, you know, we didn't know what we didn't know. So we said, we'll donate 3% of our revenues to children education and environment. And that quickly morphed uh, as our business model did, uh, which I can talk about that at some other point. But we, we said, well, let's go and find the folks who are the, you know, the experts at this. So we sought out the Patagonias and Seven Generations and became very involved in the Social Venture Network and members there. And, and then a bunch of us got together and said, well, why don't we kind of band together in, as small or medium companies and, and uh, this – we, we started this thing called B Corps, which now has become a, a very, uh, very, very large and, and growing thing, which, uh, uh, you know, it's fun to be in the first first discussions of that and, like, what, what could it be and how can we do this? And so then our, our mission really pivoted towards how can we take telecom and make people's lives better and make the environment better? And so we did a project with Bainbridge Graduate Institute in the late 2000s. And the proofs that came out of that were, you know, we can significantly reduce carbon by using more telecom and less driving in buildings. And then also uh, that spawned a project that we uh, did uh, after the last financial crisis uh, called uh, Connect Space, which was uh, using telecom in remote areas to get people jobs. And, and, um, and then we started another company out of that called Sparrow, which was a, a wireless and, you know, so it really kind of created this continuum. But Better World still keeps going all, all these years. We're still a, a B Corp after all these years and, and uh, you know, really maintain a focus on serving organizations that are making an impact in the world, but then also, uh, also, also using that telecom infrastructure uh, to, to make the world a better place for people on the planet. Fantastic. Yeah, thanks for sharing, Matt. Um, so, Chris, so let's jump over to you now. Um, what excites you about entrepreneurship, and, and how did you get involved with One Million Cups initially? I think for me, the driver is building community, helping to connect the dots. So, we have amazing organizations doing wonderful things, not only across North Carolina in the entrepreneurial space, but, but nationwide, right? Everybody's um, jumping in enthusiastically, but what I found was oftentimes what's missing are the, the dots that connect us all, the cross-pollination of, if, I guess, if you will, um, taking a macro view of the entrepreneurial space and knowing that somebody sitting in Tennessee could really help somebody in Wilson, but they just don't know each other yet. You know, Richmond, connecting people there with someone in Wilmington, et cetera. So my, professional background prior to all of this um, gave me a very strategic overview, a very strategic view, macro view. So I've applied that in the entrepreneurial space. And that probably is what drew me toward the One Million Cups program because nobody quote owns it and it's all about building community and helping to weave that web that further supports all of us. So for me, that, that was definitely a, a greater good contribution that I could make, even if it's on a local slash regional level, everyone comes to the table ready. What can I do either through my knowledge or my network to help further this entrepreneur further along on their journey? Fantastic. Yeah. And you know that we're really aligned at Riot with, with your passions as well, just bringing folks together because there's a lot of benefit in, you know, learning what people are working on and you never know how you can help each other. So one of a great job of that. Um, Crystal, I, I want to go back to you. You know, you all on the call can probably already tell that Crystal is extremely passionate about these environmental problems, and I've always admired that about her and, and her vision for Green to Go. Um, so, Crystal, tell us a little bit about the ultimate aspirations for Green to Go, and um, it, it maybe uh, on a more granular level, what are the the near term milestones that you're aiming for now? Well, I think. The, um, the, the big aspirations for green to go, you know, it sometimes things start in one town, um, but really can, if you, you work hard and you, um, refine and you adapt and you're agile, you can create something that other cities want. Um, so 1 of the things that we're really working on is, you know, there are old industry systems that aren't working. 
and we want to build in the triangle to start out with uh, a model for the infrastructure and the technology and the new supply chain that can replace some of those old systems that aren't working. And we're doing that. So we're building on the, our knowledge from what might seem like, you know, this smaller idea of takeout trash uh, to really changing the whole supply chain. We believe that, um, you know, the, the supply chain uh, strategies that we have today were at some time invented. We can invent new ones and we're really working on that. So um, one of the sort of uh, near term goals of ours is we're going to be um, launching um, our very own wash facility, which I realize doesn't sound very sexy, but it's the one thing that's actually missing from the infrastructure we currently have to move away from this taken trash economy that we have. It's not rocket science, it's washing dishes, but we can do that really well um, with technology. So, um, you know, we can um, build on our existing software and make something that is very scalable um, across the country. And the other thing I think is design. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of problems come down to design issues. So here's an example that just came to mind as uh, as I was thinking. Um, we work closely with a local recycling company who's really struggling. I mean that that whole market is another ball of wax. But one thing that they do is they dump all of their recycling onto the floor and a huge expense for them has had to repair and replace their tipping floor is what they call it. We say, well, why is everyone dumping things on the floor? And they say, well, it's because when the trucks back in, they don't meet up with the conveyor belts. So we have to dump things on the floor. And I said, I said, okay, why, why don't you just make the trucks meet up with, you know, I'm like, there's NC State students or industrial engineers who would love to help solve this problem. And they just say, well, that's just the way we've always been doing it. So we just see these problems and just, we just feel a, it's no longer a, it's not environmental anymore. It's almost like a moral obligation to solve problems that we see. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, I think that's a, a common theme with all of you is you're just looking at the world and the status quo and saying, you know, something's not right here. And if we just made a simple change, sometimes it's just a design change, like you said, Crystal, um, then it has massive impact. So uh, yeah, I certainly commend all of you for for going after those those problems. Um, so Brandon, uh, you know, bring us up to date, you know, since that first meeting at the amusement park to to now, what's happened with track it and and maybe, you know, similar to Crystal talking about near term goals. What are the goals for track it right now? Yeah, so since then, we've continued to develop the relationship with the amusement park and other amusement parks or parent company. Um, initially, it was a team of students and then it was just me. So I spent about a year really building the team, trying to raise money. And in the end of 2019, we were able to raise the money and I had the right team together to take this forward. And in the last five, six months, it's been a lot of product development. And then we got into the right accelerator, which helped us a lot getting the product to where it is today. We were planning on doing trials right when COVID-19 hit. And unfortunately, it shut down a lot of amusement parks. And we took that time to really work on the product. There was a lot of stuff we were planning on doing a soft launch in, in the park and then working on the product in the future. But we took this time to really work on the product, add a lot of stuff we were planning on adding in the future. And now we're just waiting for parks to open up in the next week or two to begin our trials. And we, we have a couple of trials planned and then we're hoping to do a launch in our first park and then expand for the rest of the year, sign contracts for beginning of 2021. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. That's great. Um, Chris, so you've seen tons of startups, you know, tell their story at 1 million cups. Um, I'm curious, have you, uh, do any come to mind as being uh, stories that you were particularly moved by their mission? Well, <sighs> Green to go was one of our earlier ones. They were, it was very, it was something that we all got excited about. And it, I have to say, Crystal, two, three years later, seeing, you know, 
the realization of walking into a restaurant um, and saying, oh my gosh, I, I, I know this company. I, that certainly was one. Um, there have been many, and so it's kind of hard to, I, I want to like include everybody, but um, okay. several, stand, several stand out. Um, a recent one was, is KWH Coin out of Wilmington, where they're applying the blockchain to clean energy solutions, um, really trying to target underserved markets as well as rural markets to try and democratize access and affordability more than anything, using the blockchain to um, strip away uh, cost the entry for some individuals um, having access to energy. So that that certainly was an important one. Uh, keepsake tales, you wouldn't think of it. Um, they're a recent presenter doing personalized personalized children's books. The reason that one struck a chord with many of us was highlighting how um, generic a lot of our major publishing actually is, and specifically for children, right? You pick up a children's book and it, they all the characters all look the same. And so they're creating a personalized way that they can digitize to have your own child, whatever race, culture, um, disability they may have to appear in their own book and then seeking partners now. So to me, that was certainly very, very important to help build from a foundation build children's confidence that we all belong in this world, right? Um, Zogo Finance, many of you probably have heard of as well, helping to um, educate and help manage teenage finance that we always, you know, not everybody like, you know, maybe Daniel and I would remember, <laughs> we might have been taught in high school how to keep a checkbook. Nobody uses a checkbook anymore, right? So we forget about these things that we were taught early on that gave us a foundation, but and, and you, you forget that has access or, you know, thinks about these things. So that was a very cool one and they've done extremely well. They have got a lot of traction going. Sweetie Pie Organics, a consumer product that helped to solve lactation issues with nursing mothers, also very important and an overlooked segment in the market that the founder who has a background in global um, consumer product goods all this, right? And so she's she's done a great job. The last one that I'll mention is one, uh, another one based in Wilmington, North Carolina, True Colors Brewing, solving the gang problem by giving individuals access, you know, economic empowerment is what I would say, taking skills that are amazing. They just happen to be being used in gangs right now, but amazing leadership skills, creativity, ideation, that sitting right there, just not being used for good and repurposing those skill sets and then helping to educate individuals from these underserved communities to give them a purpose and show them what they're capable of. And it is amazing, amazing what they're doing. True impact, numbers of killings going down, homicides, and, and you know, something that you think, eh, it's just a brewery. Hmm. It's the, it's, the concept around it, and it's absolutely scalable, right? So they're working to perfect what they're doing in Wilmington and then want obviously to um, share what they've learned and their solution with other cities who struggle under this, right? Gang violence is still a thing in our world, unfortunately, but you know they have found a way to shift something that exists into a, a true positive. And so we were honored to have all of those as presenters and many, many more. Yes, yes. Well, well, thanks for sharing those examples, Krista. Yeah, if you all haven't checked out True Colors Brewery in, in Wilmington, um, certainly look into them. Really incredible mission. Um, there's so much cool stuff happening in, in entrepreneurship in this region, um, which is just incredible. Um, Matt, I'm curious from your, your background and working on all sorts of, of initiatives, um, do you believe that there's a pattern or a formula for success in the entrepreneurship for good space? Uh, <clears throat> well, um, I, I, I can tell you what not to do. Um, I'm not sure I've oh, perfected on, on all the uh, things to do, but uh, it, at the end of the day, I would say if I were to recommend a few things, you know, lessons, lessons that we learned is that if it is a for-profit and it is a business, then that has to work first, you know, and it's very easy to get 
pulled into the the part that you know for for me I'm passionate about telecom I'm passionate about um, you know the for profit for good model as well and doing good things in the world um, it's very easy to get pulled into that side and forget or not do everything that you you need to be taken care of back at the store so uh, I, I think that is you know it has to make money it has to be profitable and you have to have customers and you know all those things that any business has to do and and you have to you have employees you have stakeholders you have all those things so you're layering on this other thing which is a you know uh, a more even you know making a difficult proposition even more difficult so in in the you know being flexible to pivot both on the business side, which we've done in multiple ventures that I've, I've been part of, actually all three that I listed, uh, what we started and what we were doing in the beginning significantly pivoted, uh, both on the mission side and on the business side throughout uh, the, the series that we were, that we were uh, doing with each. So, um, you know, be ready for both and be open to both because what we ended up with on, a, on the mission side was actually much deeper and, and much more impactful than, than where we had started. So you're learning along the way. And, um, you know, like with Better World Technology, we started out with a simple donation uh, and, and adopted the sort of Salesforce, you know, 1%, 1%, we did 3% uh, of, of all the, the categories. Uh, and then, but then we said, how do we take the product and actually make that a mission? And uh, in some, some ventures, it's very natural. That's the beginning, right? But when you look at a $2 trillion industry and you say, well, how do we, how do we motivate and activate this industry to do good things in the world? That was, that was really our mission. And so we, we sort of get to take this machine and do good things with it. Um, and and, and that is, that, that's a different kind of model. And, and so I think that the other thing too is in fundraising, you know, in, in these typical uh, things you have to do as a business, sometimes you can bootstrap it and get it up and running. But if you do seek investment, you know, there's investors that focus on for, uh, you know, for profit, for good B Corp style ventures. And then there's investors who don't, and most actually don't in terms of the numbers that are out there. And, and the ones that do, you know, at the end of the day, they're still, they still have to do what the, uh, I'll call it a traditional investor would as well. They, they have to make money. They have LPs that have given them money um, and invested in them. So, so it ends up, you know, at the end of the day, the business has to make sense from a, from a bottom line standpoint, uh, even for the impact, because uh, the impact is important, but they, they need to see that other part there too. So um, I think that's, or unless you have any other particular items that would be sure of the headline. Yeah, those are fantastic thoughts. I, I think um, you highlighted a couple things that we try to instill in the startups we work with through the Ride Accelerator program. You know, one, really analytically prioritizing your, your currencies, so your time, your money, and your relationship capital. How do you use those things in a really smart way so that you're, you're pushing things forward? Um, and then also, you know, not being so in love with the initial solution that you um, are resistant to, to pivoting when you need to pivot. Um, so, yeah, I think those are great. And I, I think that's, that's probably the most important point made so far is that time, time is the most important resource, period, in, in, in our world, right? Which is, that's the only thing you can kind of control. And as a startup, especially, or a newer company, your time is everything. So you have to be very, you know, the decision of should I go and get investment and spend all that time it's going to take, because it takes a lot of time usually, or do I go get customers and then I don't need to, you know, so, so those kinds of dynamics, and it's really great to have great advisors and, uh, and folks like Ryan <laughs> that are helping you do that. Because then you ask these questions constantly. You're asking yourself, am I spending my time wisely? Is this the best thing to move things along? And uh, it's, it's very easy to get down, down roads where you, you're busy and you're doing things, but it's really not helping the venture to, to accelerate. That's right. Yeah. Thanks, Matt. Um, yeah, so Crystal and Brandon, um, as you both have built out solutions for positive societal outcomes, uh, maybe offer one thing that, that each of you have learned on your, your process so far. 
I would say that, um, you know, what comes to mind is coronavirus times. Um, one both challenge and cool thing has been to take a look at we've been, what we've been doing and have the ability to completely reinvent ourselves, which is, you know, there's a lot of new opportunities. Trash is increasing by up to 50% now during coronavirus. Um, the sources are different, you know, uh, so we can take a look at, okay, what are the new customer target markets that uh, where people will pay and we're also affecting the kind of impact we want to make. So, um, you know, it's a little scary. I think that's a big challenge, just being as agile as you can be um, in, you know, pivoting when the times call for it. Uh, but it's both challenging and exciting. Yeah, that's that's really good, Crystal. I think uh, you bring up an extremely important point, just shifting with the market shifts, um, you know, whether they're drastic and sudden like that we've experienced with COVID-19 or just the, you know, the normal, you know, pattern of how markets change over time. Um, great. Brandon, what do you think? What have you learned so far? Yeah, so for us, it's been, I know Matthew briefly touched on it. It's been not getting super attached to the problem. Um, we have to know that the company still needs to make money for us to be able to grow, to fix other uh, problems that exist, still pay your employees, your investors need to make money. And every time we talk to a new parent, we've spoken to over 100 parents in one on one interviews to hear their story to better the product. And when I hear their stories of them having having to go through the process of reimagining losing their child, their past experiences and everything, it's really easy to get super attached to it and forget about the we need to survive as a company and make money. And all right, we have to design something to prevent that. And I'll also echo what Crystal said, which is flexibility and just making pivots. We are constantly making small pivots. We recently made a major pivot in our product as well to get going, to get the product to market. And this is always a big advice I give to other startups. Like, don't be afraid of that. It, it will only help you if you're flexible. If you're not flexible and you're dead straight on that path that you're taking, it can be really hard when something like COVID-19 happens. But if you're willing to learn and adapt, it can take you there a lot faster and it can definitely better your company. Great, thanks. Um, all right, so I'm getting ready to turn it over to audience questions. So um, audience, if you have questions for any of our panelists, please type those into the chat window now. Um, before we hand it over to the audience, uh, let me ask our panelists one, one quick question. So maybe try to answer in, in one sentence. Um, I wanna know just really briefly what drives each of you. So Krista, maybe we'll start with you. Mm, the gratification of, I, again, bringing, connecting the dots, bringing people together uh, to s for the greater good, for the yeah. impact that those connections have, yeah. I love that, great. All right, uh, Matt? Well, I, I had a, a great um, uh, mentor uh, in, in my earlier years and uh, now as a lifelong friend and and he taught me that uh, you know giving back is 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 not a right but a duty, and it's uh, it's it's uh, been every day in my life for since I was in my early twenties, um, which is just a couple of years ago. But I uh, I I was fortunate enough to start have the opportunity to start building that into my my day job as well, and. Uh, and and it's been the most uh, you know fruitful part of my life in terms of any any impact that we've been able to have. Um, you know, it, it's the most satisfying thing I've had. Thanks, Matt. Crystal. I think uh, what drives me and what's also simultaneously one of the most enjoyable parts of what I do is uh, working with my amazing team. I think we all have the same disease, which is. Uh, we're compulsively compelled to solve problems. We just can't help it. It might actually be a mental health disorder. We just love it. Um, and we love putting our minds together and creating something um, viable and applicable that we can actually execute. Again, one of the most passionate teams I know is, is your team. <laughs> so that's great. Uh, Brandon. Mine is same as Crystal, my team. Um, the 
all of us together working towards the vision we have for the company. And by my team, it's not just my employees, it's also uh, my mentors, our advisors, my investors, our contractors, anyone we work with, we engage with on an ongoing basis um, to work on the company and the market and everything just collectively. Um, this really motivates me to come to work every morning and work towards making this company and growing this company. Awesome. Thanks for sharing, y'all. Caroline, I will pass it over to you. Do we have any questions coming through for our panelists? Hi, Rachel. The Q&A box is actually pretty quiet. Um, so if, if anyone does have questions, I encourage you to put those in the chat or Q&A box. Um, we did have a, a question earlier that Daniel was kind enough to answer in line. So I'll read it aloud just for everyone who may be interested. Um, if you're interested in seeing past success stories on the um, from Call for Code, you can find that on the IBM.com site. Um, so please check that out if you are interested in those success stories. Are panelists allowed to ask questions? Go for it, Chrissa. <laughs> So Brandon, I have a potential, maybe not pivot, but a sh you know, also a shift for another um, channel potentially for you. Still parents, but maybe not tied specifically to amusement parks. So an example, um, we adopted our son when he was young, still learning English, um, too big to fit in the grocery cart. So they have to, you, you know, how do you buy groceries and hold a child's hand and I would turn around and he would be good. I could call his name, but he was still getting used to his new name, right? He still didn't speak English very well. It was a nightmare. It was traumatic. Um, but I think if you had a subscription model or what, whatever for parents in general, we could use them anywhere, right? At the beach scares me, scares the living daylight out of me when he would just run on the beach. It, all kinds of scenarios, not just amusement parks and parents I'm telling you, <laughs> they would eat it up. Absolutely. We are definitely on our roadmap. We plan on entering a lot of different markets. Uh, the B2C market is a little saturated. There are some other products. None of them are perfect from what from the analysis that we have done. But the B2C market is a little saturated. There are some products out there. That's why right now we are focusing on the B2B market um, where, where we can enter a lot easier. On our roadmap, we do have a lot of different industries that we plan on entering and eventually definitely the B2C market where once we perf perfect the product, uh, there's a lot of stuff that we don't have right now, including a long enough battery life to be able to sell directly to consumer. Right now, it's good enough for a full day at an amusement park, but it won't be something that would satisfy a parent if they were to directly buy it from us right now for everyday use. So as we generate revenue, we work on the product and we grow. That's definitely an area we're going to focus on. Clearly, it's in Florida too. Thank you so much, Brandon. Um, we do have a question here that can be directed towards all of our panelists. So please feel free, um, all of our panelists, to answer this one. How do you determine during the hiring process if the candidate is complementary or in alignment with your company's vision and goals? Well, I, I'm in a lucky position where we have a lot of people who um, want to intern with us. Um, and I think they're just really attracted to the mission so we can easily sort of vet them. Um, and then we often hire um, who has been a past intern with us. So that's one thing. And then direct hires, I've just asked them to give their story um, because I think a lot is revealed when you see how long they've been thinking about um, the same type of goals, the same type of vision. Um, yeah. To echo what Crystal said, there are a lot of internship opportunities that universities have right now that won't even cost your company any money. Working, We're working with NC State and Elon University. We get a lot of, we have nine interns for this summer right now. And they are working towards class credit. They work about 20 hours for the company. And we have hired some of our interns from the past semesters. Um, and I like to spend that time, not just if they know, if they have the knowledge, because they can grow in it. Um, that's certainly what I'm doing and what the rest of the team is doing. We learn every day. But if they're fun to work with, if they can keep the culture high enough, if you enjoy hanging out with them on a weekend, that's nothing to do with work. 
And those are all stuff that I evaluate through the intern process or just any hire process. Yeah, I think, I think looking at the uh, individual and how you, you can look at their, you know, the past is a great indicator of the future, right? So uh, if they have been involved with or, or working on uh, either as a, uh, a paid position or on their, on their own time, uh, like-minded uh, causes or, or, or efforts, uh, that's a that's a great uh, first box to you know to check, and then um, you know that that passion comes out. It, it it it's apparent, and you can feel it. And you know you're in this for something else other than uh, just a, a career or, or checking a box. And 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 that's where you, your sixth sense uh, you know sort of comes in. And it it is uh, important though because you know the one thing we've realized over these, you know, past, I'll say, years, <laughs> just to not, I'm trying really hard not to date myself here, but the, uh, the, the mission from a, I, I hate to say human resource, from a people standpoint is uh, what holds you together through thick and thin and what gets you to the other side um, when, when times aren't uh, you know, working out in terms of the business side or the bottom line side, and uh, and you want everybody you know in the boat rowing together, and and that's just very important to to make sure that that is a passion point for anybody that's been part of the organization. It's very very important. These are all great inputs. Um, thank you so much, everyone. Um, what? Are your what is everyone's preferred methods to finding employees and or interns? Asking Riot <laughs> for help. Yeah, talent is an, an ongoing challenge for sure. Riot and also we have a good relationship with Duke University since we're based in Durham. They have this great entrepreneur um, innovation and entrepreneurship department. We just circulate what we need and um, we have to uh, practically beat the interns and um, candidates away with a stick. Um, <laughs> so we're lucky to get lots and lots of response. Yeah, I'm certainly fortunate in this area to have fantastic universities and community colleges. So th that helps certainly with the, the talent pipelining. Yes, definitely. Um, Brandon, this next question is for you. Is the device that the child wears paired with a phone or is it standalone with its own GPS chip? It's standalone with its own GPS and cellular chip, cellular module, and uh, connects to our backend database and then our app access or is connected to that database and shows the location every roughly 10 to 15 seconds or 7 to 10. Brandon, are the, are the bracelets or the the device um, reusable or disposable? It's reusable. So we expect to get about 360 days of use from them at least. And afterwards, we plan on refurbishing them and donating them to third world countries so they can use it in some form factor. But that's the current plan for the company. Awesome. Any more questions, Caroline? That is all from the crowd, Rachel. Great. Well, thanks for those questions, y'all. Um, panelists, thanks for, for joining us. It's incredible to hear so many awesome examples of entrepreneurship for good. Um, and not only that, you know, real businesses that are finding sustainable models. Um, so thanks for, you know, just scratching the surface of all the cool work that's going on. Um, one final question to, to wrap us up today. Um, I'd love a, a lightning answer from everyone, including Daniel, if you'd like to participate. Um, what are you most optimistic about right now? Matt, you want to get us started? Uh, I'll get started if uh, Matt doesn't want to. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I didn't hear. I didn't hear that, Matt. Um, I think uh, optimistic about um, the resiliency of people and and um, you know, when we're faced with challenges, 
uh, that we that we come out in a better place. And I, I think we're gonna, I think all this going on is gonna quickly put us in a better place than we were uh, just six months ago. Good answer. I would say human ingenuity. It never ceases to amaze. Awesome. Thanks, Crystal. I'm sorry, that was Krissa. Thanks, Krissa. <laughs> Yeah, I would say, um, no, it's it's amazing how technology, you know, it's, we see a lot about the negative stories about what it does, exposure to too much kids to too many devices or technology being used to hack elections. But the flip side of that is technology becoming more part of what we are as a species. There's good and bad, and we focus on the bad, but the good, the amazing solutions that are coming out from programs like Call for Code and what people are doing in the startup communities like Riot, it's it's amazing because there's so many great stories out there. And um, you know, technology is just one aspect of of humanity, good and po uh, positive and negative. But we really got to focus on the positive and see what we can do with it. I'm most optimistic about uh, consumer awareness, industry awareness of the things I'm passionate about, um, the things we're trying to make impact on. I mean, I think of innovation as sort of the supply, and then customer awareness as part of the demand, and we're seeing bigger and bigger demand for these kind of solutions. And of course, for us customers, the more customers, um, the more impact. So we can grow in um, all in this space. All of us can grow in this space um, in both revenue and impact. I would say the willingness for companies, parks, people to try new products, to um, connect everyone together, drive up engagement and really help each other. Fantastic. Thank you all for sharing your insight today. Um, really appreciate it. Uh, great, great group of panelists. And Daniel, thanks again for joining us from IBM. Um, awesome. Well, thank, thanks to our audience for um, taking some time today to connect with us. Um, again, you can uh, see this session, record it. It'll be out on our channel soon. Um, and as always, want to thank our sponsors for making the work that we do go around. Um, yeah, and everyone have a fantastic day and uh, you know where to find us if you'd like to talk further. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks y'all. Right. Take care. Bye-bye.